Good morning and welcome to those who worship with us in person and those who have found us online. Uh, my name is Joel and this is Rob and together we are Towson Presbyterian Church, a community of faith that is striving to be inclusive, curious, compassionate, and courageous. This morning is World Communion Sunday where we gather with Christians all over the globe uh, and together signify our unity, our togetherness in Christ. So if you haven't already, we invite you to gather the elements uh, from home and bring them before you, whatever you can find, either a piece of bread or a cracker, water, juice, or a little wine. If you haven't yet, grab them where we will celebrate communion together later in the service. You can also find our bulletin online to uh, join us throughout the service and our liturgy, uh, towsonpress.org, under the worship um, icon, down under the, is it worship? Worship and then down to Down bulletin. to bulletin. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yep. And on, in that bulletin, you'll also see, friends, uh, a link to uh, our second remote coffee hour. So we hope that after our worship service ends this morning, you might take an opportunity to jump off of Facebook Live and onto Zoom. You don't have to have a Zoom account uh, to participate. Just click that link and it should take you into the meeting. We would love to be able to connect um, to those we know and an opportunity to make new friends as well. A couple announcements uh, to share. Church school just met. Uh, they meet right before the service from 9.15 to 9.45. Youth group meets later tonight outside on the manse um, from 4 to 5 o'clock. You can find our spiritual formation for adults opportunities on our website at towsonpress.org. Uh, our men's group kicks off again. We meet tomorrow night again on the manse lawn from 7 to 8 15 all men are invited to join us to bring a chair um, and something to drink with you uh, and then next week is our blessing of the animals service so if you have a pet we encourage you to bring them next sunday we'll meet from 3 to 3 30 again outside on our manse lawn uh, everyone needs a mask and to be socially distanced as well that's right. Things are moving and grooving as we are at stage 1.5 of our regathering plan. Session and our regathering task force continue to monitor um, not only the current metrics, but also uh, continual updates and advice from uh, community and health experts. So uh, we will be sharing more news um, as soon as we're able to, but we are beginning to gather outside in these socially distanced and masked ways. So we hope that you will be joining us. Um, in addition to the announcements and the invitation to participate, we have joyful news regarding the Berger family. Yes. Um, Andrew and Emily Berger gave birth to Madeline on Friday. Uh, so we give thanks to Madeline and the gift of new life found in their family. And if you'll allow a moment of pastoral privilege, uh, one of our own here this morning is celebrating a very special day. Mr. Scott Elson, who's currently behind the camera right now. <laughs> we want to wish you, Scott, there he is, a very happy and healthy birthday. We're incredibly grateful for all that you and Jim and Rena do to make these services possible. So happy birthday, brother. All that shared, friends, let us now set our hearts and minds on God as we join in our call to worship. In the midst of uncertain times, it's good to remind ourselves what will be. We worship the God whose promises stand firm forever. Scripture tells us that God's kingdom will contain a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages. We worship the God who created every nation, tribe, people, and language out of love. God's promise of grace is offered to all. 
Following his death and resurrection, Jesus commissioned his followers to go and make disciples of all nations. We worship the God who calls us from the sidelines and into the work of the kingdom. Amid the celebration of communion today, we are in different places yet united in the one spirit. We are part of the universal, diverse church that crosses every boundary. Let us worship God Almighty. Friends, confession not only reminds us that we so often miss the mark, but that we we are not yet 
finished. We are still in the making. We are still changing. We are still slowly becoming who God is calling us to be. Please join me in our prayer of confession. God of community and love, you've called us to one table, but we've pursued our own course. You've called us to love our neighbors, but we've done little to serve those who know the pain of hunger or struggle amid a lack of clean water or access to health care or education. Hear our confession of indifference and neglect. Then, Eternal One, feed us with your grace until we hunger to be a part of the feeding and healing of this world. Open our hearts until we embrace those in poverty, wherever they are, and reach out towards those who are different from us. Expand our awareness of the structures and systems that need to change so that all of every nation and race might break bread together. Even when our cups run dry and our plates seem empty, God's generosity overflows. Children of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, it claims you, it redeems you, it equips you, it calls you into the work of God's kingdom. Thanks be to God. Amen. Because immeasurable love is not something we keep to ourselves. We practice sharing it with those around us, physically and remotely. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. So we invite you, if you haven't had a chance yet, friends, to check in online. Share that you're here. Extend your remote neighbors the greeting of peace and love and welcome. And children, we invite you to make sure you are in a good spot to share in our children's message now that Miss Janess will be leading. Good morning. This is the story of feeding the 5,000 using godly play. I wonder what this is. And this. Once there was a man 
who preached and healed people. It was Jesus. One day, the disciples and he went to a lonely and bleak place. Jesus and the disciples had crossed Lake Galilee, and a large crowd, large, had gathered to meet him because they had heard about his miracles of healing of those who were ill. The large, the large crowd listened all day to his stories. They listened until it was near the end of the day, and they were getting hungry. Philip said, where can we get enough food to feed all these people? Then Andrew saw somebody with five loaves of barley, bread, and two fish. But it's not enough to feed the large crowd. Jesus said, have everyone sit down. Then Jesus took the bread and he thanked God. Then Jesus took the fish and blessed the fish and thanked God. Then Jesus told the disciples to pass the food out. And there was more than enough for everyone. After the meal, Jesus said, gather up everything that is left over. And there were 12 baskets of food and fish and bread left over. The disciples were astounded. The crowd was astounded. Look, the crowd said they were amazed and they wanted to be with Jesus even more. I wonder, I wonder what the disciples thought as they gathered up the 12 baskets of fish and bread. I wonder what the crowd thought when there was such a little bit of food and it became enough for everyone. I wonder what you think is the most important part of the story. Thank you, Ms. Janess. This morning's scriptures will be read by two of our confirmation teams. My name is Abby Carter, and our first scripture reading comes from Luke chapter 5, verses 27 through 32. After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up, left everything, and followed him. Then Levi gave a great banquet for him in his house. 
and there was a large crowd of tax collectors and others sitting at the table with them. The Pharisees and scribes were complaining to his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners to repentance. My name is Eliza Mealy, and our second scripture is Luke chapter 9, verses 10 through 17. On their return, the apostles told Jesus all they had done. He took them with him and withdrew privately to a city called Bethesda. When the crowds found out about it, they followed him, and he welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed to be cured. The day was drawn to a close, and the twelve came to him and said, Send the crowd away so that they may go into the surrounding villages and countryside to lodge and take provi and get provisions. For here we are in a deserted place. But he said to them, You give them something to eat. And they said, We have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless we are to go out and buy food for all these people. For there were about five thousand men. And he said to the disciples, Make them sit down in groups of about 50 each. They did so and made them all sit down. And taking the five loaves and two fish, he looked to the heavens, blessed and broke them, and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. And all ate and all were filled. What was left over was gathered up into 12 baskets of broken pieces. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, and for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Friends, today, in addition to talking about World Communion Sunday, we're diving into what has to be, by far in fact, the tastiest of all faith practices, food. Yum. Food as a faith practice. Seriously, have you actually ever thought of food as a faith practice? Well, food as a means of practicing my faith. Well, scripture is filled with stories revolving around food. And in the church, we've long celebrated communion with bread and wine as a central element of our worship service. And then there's the practice of fasting or refraining from eating for a period of time in order to spend that time in prayer or service to others. But honestly, I don't know if I've ever thought of food in of and of itself as a faith practice. Yeah, and I'm right there with you. Uh, you know, but as you said, Scripture is overflowing with stories that center in some way on food, in part because food is so central to life in of itself. While some of us, like, like I do, we live to eat, we all have to eat in order to live. I mean, food is essential. Food is necessary. And it's not just that, but food is also, we could say, a means of identification, right? Yeah. So, I mean, just look at this spread in front of us right here. We have various cultural foods that represent different regions and nations, different ethnicities and cultures, demonstrating how food can connect us back with our ancestors mm -hmm. and from lands from hundreds, even thousands of years ago, reminding us of who we are and where we came from. That's right. We've tried to represent uh, different areas, different cultures here. We've got different breads. We've got soft tortillas and hard taco shells. We've got Greek pita bread, French baguettes. We've got some various kinds of fruit, a couple mangoes, papaya, a tomatillo, star fruit how funky is that we've got potatoes and grain we've got rice and beans a stable a stable in so many cultures we've got rice and curry a staple of the far east we've got, got healthy plantains. homegrown fruits and vegetables right alongside a bag of potato chips <laughs> Yeah, and all these are just a tiny fraction of culturally identifying foods, right? But there are also those kinds of foods that are even more intimately tied to our hearts and our identities. They're, they're foods that 
hearken or take us back to people and times and places we hold dear. They can connect us very meaningfully with memories that fill us with hope or love or peace. Now, many call this phenomena comfort food because it does so much more than fill our bo bellies and our bodies. It, it touches our hearts. So what's one of your comfort foods? Well, so for me, it's actually a, a restaurant in my hometown of Unionville, Connecticut. It's called George's. And while George's is primarily a pizza place, there's something else I love to get there. And it's in Connecticut. We don't call them hoagies. We don't call them subs. We call them grinders. <laughs> That's not good. And George's makes a great grinder. And just thinking about it reminds me of home and family and memories that make me smile. Gotta love a good hoagie, don't you? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> How about you, Rob? Uh, I have quite a few. One would be my, my mother's homemade soup, something warm about soup. But if I had to pick just one, it would be my grandmother's homemade macaroni and cheese. Even the smell of cooking pasta to this day, it will take me back to when I was a little boy just sitting in my grandmother's kitchen joyfully anticipating that meal. Well, clearly, food is more than just physical nourishment. It's also connected to our memories. It's connected to our emotions. So we shouldn't be surprised that it's also very intimately connected to our faith as well. Yeah, as Jesus revealed time and again throughout all four Gospels, right? Faith and food, they go hand in hand. So much so that it was actually really hard to pick just two scripture lessons to epitomize what we're talking about here today. But that was the limit we gave ourselves, so we stuck with the two that um, we had so wonderfully read by Abby and Eliza. The first one we selected was Luke 5, in which a bunch of religious elites, or those in power, go and confront Jesus for the people that he was eating with. Now, what was originally offensive about this story wasn't the religious leaders' objections to Jesus eating with sinners. It was to the very idea that Jesus, a respected rabbi of his day, who even his opponents agreed was to be respected, would eat with such an unacceptable company. Yeah, just as it still does today, if we're being honest, right? The table at which we eat says something about us. So if you ate back then with the political elites, that meant that you held powerful company, and so you had power yourself. Or if you ate with, say, the religiously powerful, it meant that you were liturgically connected and considered holier than other people. And if you, say, ate with the peasant class, it meant you were counted among the majority. You were fairly oppressed, but you also still had enough. You had citizenship of the land, and you had good company that you could keep. But if you were sick, or if you were a known sinner to have done something wrong, or if you were simply poor, it meant you had none of these things. And it meant you were outcast. And it meant that people would not eat with you lest they be outcast too. To eat with someone was to identify with that person, to take the school or workplace lunchroom, for example. Can you remember the pain on the first days of school trying to find the right table to sit at, a table that you'd be welcome at but wouldn't necessarily lower your social standing? Same thing for adults at work or in our leisure or before COVID in our homes. How many of us, honestly, eat at tables of diversity, right? How many of us eat with those who have a different ethnicity than we do? 
or a significantly lower socioeconomic status than we do? Do we intentionally eat with those who are different than we are, those who live with greater needs than we do? You see, these are important questions because for Jesus, food was a way of practicing true community, not purity. It was a way of practicing inclusion, never exclusion. It was a way for not only receiving nourishment, but also celebrating abundance rather than buying into the notion of scarcity that we fear. It's why Jesus practiced his faith by using food to cross the boundaries his faith demanded he cross. Food was a vehicle by which he did that. It's why he made sure he ate with all kinds of people, his disciples and with prostitutes, respected political leaders of his day and the tax collectors. Now in Luke chapter 9, our second reading, we uncover Jesus miraculously feeding 5,000 men plus women and children who would come to hear from him on a Galilean hillside. Except when the hour grew late and the disciples realized they had no food, they went to Jesus to send them on their way before it was too late for everyone to eat. But that's not exactly what Jesus did, right? He told his disciples, you give them something to eat. You, my followers, feed the hungry. I love this miracle because... It is here where Jesus demonstrates that we truly live in an economy of abundance, not scarcity. You know, the world currently produces more than enough food to feed every living soul. And let's be clear, the world has made tremendous strides in making sure that all receive food. Governments and NGOs deserve so much credit for the work that they're doing. And yet tonight we know that there will children, there are children in Towson who are going to go hungry and without dinner. And there will be families that spend the entire day without food in Baltimore City. And entire communities are struggling, not just throughout this land, but particularly in the mountaintops of Haiti or the villages of Yemen or the remote areas throughout Africa and parts of Asia. While well, Jesus makes clear that no one should go hungry, no one, whether they can afford food or, or not, we must recognize how many in America and throughout the world who either lack access to or can't access healthy food. Because of the higher costs of fruits, vegetables, and healthy proteins, these families eat what they can afford, which is often the highly processed, unhealthy foods that aren't intended to be the staple of anyone's diet. You know, it's actually why there are so many impoverished people who are both overweight and malnourished, right? They cannot afford the healthy food, or at least enough of it to feel full, so they eat the highly processed unhealthy foods, which then leads to malnourishment, which leads to additional health conditions, which they can't afford to treat, which just sends their violent cycle of poverty spinning all the more. You see, because food is so central to life, it is also central to our faith and the way we seek to live out our response to God. At TPC, we try and do this in numerous ways. Our intergenerational garden is a wonderful example of how we connect our faith with our food. The food our garden produces goes straight to the Assistance Center of Towson Churches and helps feed people who struggle to put food on their table and make ends meet. Every year, our garden produces roughly 300 pounds of food. Amen. And ACTC, the Assistance Center of Towson Churches, has long been one of TPC's primary mission partners. And while their ministry is so much more than just food, the amount of food they donate to our community's homeless, working poor, and those 
who have fallen on hard times is simply astounding. Mm. And over the summer, in the midst of COVID-19, TPC began a partnership with the Student Support Network, which goes above and beyond in their work with Baltimore County Schools to provide food and assistance for children and teens and their families who are struggling. But it's not enough. More can still be done. And our faith demands that we practice food better. So as we work our way through this seven-week series on new faith practices, friends, there's going to be a take-home each week. We hope you've been endeavoring these yourself. So here's our take-home for you this week. There's three elements we would invite you to explore, and we think that they will be both meaningful and enjoyable. First is plan a meal around comfort food. Make sure if you live in a family that everybody gets to pick part of that meal. But make sure that everyone has a meal that will make them happier, that connects to a meaningful memory. And as you eat, explore the feeling that that food gives you. Explore the memory to which it connects you. Explore feelings of love and warmth that build up within you. Comfort food. The second, eat a meal from another culture. Or if you're not able to meet to make it or purchase an entire meal from another culture, at least eat a food, a fruit, or a vegetable. And when you do, explore that region, that culture of that land from which the food comes. Learn about some of that culture's history and then reflect on how God is just as present in that culture, in that land, with their people as God is in ours. And then finally, finally we would ask that you take the additional step of giving a donation, a donation of your money, a donation of actual food, or a donation of uh, your time and energy to a local charity that combats food insecurity. We've already named a few. We would invite you to explore them, or perhaps one that you're well aware of and have a passion for. So in doing so, we are practicing the way in which food both expands our table but also enables us to reach further and further out and extend the love and grace of God. So today, as we celebrate World Communion Sunday, a day in which we gather with Christians across the globe at our Lord's table, we take intentional time to remember that first, food is both a means of nourishment as well as connection. And it's also for everyone. It's given readily and freely, not to be hoarded or reserved. For when food is shared widely and appreciated deeply, as this table makes clear, it becomes a means of God's grace in our lives, a meal of unity and love with God and with each other. So friends, let us practice our faith as we now prepare for the feast. So if you do not have it with you already, we would invite you to grab a piece of bread or a cracker, a cup of wine or juice or water as we come to our Lord's table, gathering with Christians from around the world. For on World Communion Sunday, we remember that in the early hours of this morning, while all was quiet and dark here at home, the sun was rising on the other side of the world. And with the dawn of this new day, God's people began gathering for worship amid the sounds of drums and pipes and stringed instruments and pianos and organs. And now we too get to join in this joyful celebration with all those who call upon the name of our Lord. For this is, friends, the joyful feast of unity. 
we celebrate how Christ has gathered people from around the world to share in this feast, across political lines, economic lines, in places where there are powerfully and politically connected people, and also those where there are the poorest of the poor. With all of them, we share a meal, remembering and celebrating the one who proved shalom, deep peace possible. And so come, you from the east and the west, the north and the south, come with your doubts, come with your hopes, come with your inadequacies, come with your strengths. Come because this is a table where all are invited and God's grace and love intentionally reach out to welcome you. Friends, may the God of new life be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the God that we love. Let us pray. Lord, as we gather around this wonderful meal, everywhere and in every place, as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, linking arms around the world, pour your grace into us all. Bless us with your presence as we pray to you. O oh God, may we see in each other your light and your love and your hope for this world. May it not matter our differences, our names, our languages, what separates us, but may what matter today and every day be the commandment we share to love one another. And as we pray, we remember our brothers and sisters who are unable to be with us today, whether in body or spirit. May you bring comfort to those who are grieving, lonely, heartbroken, ill, or whose spirits are broken. May you strengthen those whose lives feel hopeless, don't make sense, and are experiencing loss. May they hear the healing word they need to receive today. May you bring the human touch of love to those who have not been touched. May you love the unloved through us, O oh God. Lord, may you use us, your saints here at TPC and your saints throughout the world to shine your light into those whose world is covered in darkness. May you use us to feed the hungry, to clothe the ones who need clothes, give a cup of water to those who are thirsty. May you use us to awaken lives to you, O oh God, to your love and to your kingdom whose door is always open to all. O oh God, pour out your spirit upon us in these gifts. May we now be for the world, the loving and serving and forgiving body of Christ it so desperately needs. Send us out in the power of the spirit to live for others as Christ lived for us. For together we offer to you the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The night Jesus was betrayed, he gathered with his friends for a meal. And after giving thanks to God, he took the bread and broke it. And he gave it to each of them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body I give to you. Do this in memory of me.
And in the same way, after they had shared their meal, our Lord took the cup. And after giving thanks and blessing it, he shared that this is the cup of the new covenant sealed in my blood, shared for the forgiveness of all sin. Drink of this, remembering me. For as the Apostle Paul declared, as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's saving death until he comes again. Friends, these are the gifts of God for you, for us, the people of God. Let us share in the feast.
Friends, we are grateful for the gifts that you give, for they enable us to be the body of Christ into, wor into the world, to share the good news of God's love here in Towson and throughout the world. You can find four ways to give in our bulletin. We give thanks for you and your gifts and your ministry with us. Amen. And remember, friends, as you go forth, we challenge you to endeavor to practice your faith through food in these three ways. A meal of comfort. Explore the connections that it offers you and the way it touches your soul. Multicultural. Explore food from another land with a different history. Learn about it and explore God's presence with it. And give. Give from an economy of abundance so that others don't have to go out. Food is a means of crossing boundaries. Food is a means of literally giving life. Go, friends, practice your faith through the gift of food, knowing that the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion and power of the Spirit are yours now and always. Amen. Everyone, this is a little out of the ordinary, but would you join me in singing the postlude today? Come to the table. Yeah. 